All right, welcome everybody uh, to Graveyards of Academe, the Necroliberal University, which we really should have saved for Halloween. It would have been much more fun then. Um, I'm Matt Cheney. I'm Director of Interdisciplinary Studies here at Plymouth State, and so work uh, inside the CoLab. And joining me today is Nick Helms uh, from the English Department. Hi, Nick. Afternoon, good to be here. Uh, and Nick and I have not planned how we're actually going to, to work through this, which we really envisioned as a kind of discussion more than anything else, because I can't, sir, I, I won't speak for Nick, but I can't claim any grand expertise in any of this. It's just the article grabbed our attention and uh, we in the collab thought there was some interesting stuff within it to talk about um, whether agreeing with it or not. Uh, it certainly is provocative. And so it seemed like a, a perfect event for the collab um, to take some provocative stuff and, and throw it out there and see what we make of it, see what we can, we can discover. Um, so I figured the way we might start is I've got a quick uh, 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 slide deck to share with you of just some basic concepts and quotes from the article. And then I figured we could uh, go into conversation and discussion and see where this leads us, if that works for everybody. Does that work for you, Nick? Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. So I will share my screen now. And with luck, you are all seeing the graveyards. All right, so um, this is a, about this reading from the AAUP's uh, magazine, uh, Academe. And you don't have to have read it, don't worry, we didn't expect everybody has read it. If you have, that's great. Um, we're gonna pull some stuff out of it. Uh, I will share this slide deck once I'm not sharing my screen, I'll put the link into uh, the chat so you all can, can follow up with it if you're, you're curious. But basically what these authors are doing is creating a new um, word, a neologism, from some other neologisms that uh, have a little bit more history. The first uh, coming from Michel Foucault's idea of the biopolitical, the idea of defending, uh, from defending the sovereign that is like the king to defending all of society. So no longer are you going to war for the king, you're going to war to defend society. Then uh, Achille Mbembe, came up with the great idea of necropolitics, particularly talking within a post-colonial framework. So his great book, uh, Necropolitics. Um, and in uh, the concept of necropolitics, Mbembe is getting at the idea that those with power now within a post-colonial world and a colonial world have the power to dictate who lives and who dies, the, the power really to um, decide what and who is sacrificial. He's also drawing on some ideas, not just from Foucault, but also Agamben. Um, And there is uh, one thing that uh, Mbembe is really looking at it from the point of view of um, the less developed countries and um, particularly the post-colonial, the former colonies. Uh, and our writers, Balthazar, whose name I misspelled there, I think, uh, and Bill Mullen write in their article that in the first world, it appears more subtly, this necropolitical point of view as lower life expectancies for African-Americans and the poor, as the mass detention of migrants, as as a thousand or more killings by police each year. Then there's also that um, the word neoliberal, um, which is used so frequently these days and can feel like a real catchword that doesn't have any meaning, but it really does have a, have a meaning um, that we can, we can point to. Um, and that is the idea that everything can be understood through the market, the idea that everything can and should be financialized. There's um, a concept within a lot of neoliberalism that crisis is an opportunity, that um, never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, is something you will, you will hear associated with ne neoliberalism, though it, it sort of predates it, that, that saying. Um, disruption is creativity, and it's an eternal law that there will always be winners and losers. Um, to know a lot more about neoliberalism, uh, you can read Philip Murawski's wonderful book, Never Let a Serious Crisis Go to Waste. I'm going to skip this very uh, full slide. It's there for your interest if you um, really want to dig into this at all. But we're here to talk about Balthazar and Mullen um, and their idea of necroliberalism. So 
They say, and I'm really trying to, to just present their article here as much as I can and not editorialize in the least. Um, they say that necroliberalism is visible in universities via uh, in those institutions' responses to the COVID pandemic. They were writing this early on in, in COVID. We were talking about who could and could not um, uh, work during this. Um, also in the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, in police violence. These are things that really came up this summer a lot, um, particularly in relationship to universities. And so they were writing something somewhat in response to that, as well as more generally privatization and outsourcing. For instance, the example they use is various dining services, such as Aramark provide services to universities and to prisons. And then I had no good word for this, but um, administrationization of everything, um, which they get into some. It's the movement of power into administration uh, away from faculty. Obviously, it's an AAUP publication, so obviously it's um, very much on the side of faculty. All right. Uh, a couple of quotes, I'm not gonna read this whole quote. Um, again, I'll give you the link to this slide deck and you can see, but really what it's getting at is that our idea of the university as a place separate from the ugly realities of the real world actually contributes to our inability to perceive struggles and oppressions. We see the university as the place of safety and goodness separate from the world, um, a, a place of equality amongst all. Um, and that is not true, uh, and they argue that that causes, um, or that, that leads to a lot of uh, inequalities itself. And then their last sentence is so provocative, I couldn't help but, but put it here because I thought it might lead us to some good discussion. Uh, they said, for many years, the university has been imagined as a site removed, a place in which class, race, and social conflict can be managed. That era is over. The madness now has a glossy 30 page brochure and an ever increasing death count. All right. So that's what we have for the article. And again, I think it was interesting rereading it again for today was, was how much it, it feels very much of its time um, in that moment when it was terrifying to contemplate going back to potentially face-to-face -face classes because that was the moment that provoked this article. Um, and I'm wondering now as we discuss it, if we can pull out what, um, how applicable this still is and, and how much, um, how it might help us clarify things moving forward. But um, Nick, can I turn it over to you for any thoughts or questions you might want to offer? Uh, yeah, so um, three, I, I mean, uh, uh, those of you who know me know I'm probably, like I'm mostly here for uh, uh, cranky commentary and uh, random Shakespearean illusions. Um, this is all going to be cranky commentary. Um, so one thing that I was thinking of today before this talk, and we, and we mentioned before we started the recording that, um, uh, that this event didn't get advertised as well as it might have because March 1st snuck up on, snuck up on us. Um, the semester is moving forward at a, at a, a frightening, at a lightning pace. Um, and I think uh, one of the things we might talk about is the ways that, um, in, a, in a diffuse way, the ways that um, this event and this discussion kind of went under the radar and got pushed out of the things that we could manage in a week are exactly the types of systems that lead to the necroliberal university about uh, overburdening everybody with work, defining people's value in terms of work, and then um, writing off humanity, life, health, mental health as, you know, sort of like a, a bit of a profit loss, but not a, a real problem to the way the system runs. Um, uh, so that's thought number one. Um, thought number two, make sure I'm recovering these, all, all these. Um, I'm really intrigued by the way that, uh, I think another way of paraphrasing, um, sort of like necroliberalism versus um, a, uh, a notion of the university as community is thinking about profit versus care. Um, the motive of, the of, of higher ed as being a system designed around profit, maximizing profit, minimizing expense, um, you know, insert Sununu here. 
um, and versus uh, the university as a public good, education as a public good. Education is a place where students' needs also need to be met. Um, the very idea of like a basic needs statement about and campus care resources um, comes with it a different logic than um, that profit-driven motive from necroliberal universities. So care versus profit, I think, is a good rubric. Um, not that care resources won't masquerade as care and actually be actually be implements of profit and implements of necroliberalism. Um, I'm thinking of um, uh, I'm thinking of benefit systems or accommodation systems that are built more around protecting universities and employees from liability than they are about meeting students' needs. Um, for for example, which which I think is the general case of um, ADA accommodations in higher ed and in America at large. It's about avoiding liability rather than providing access. Um, and we and the, the list goes on for systems that masquerade as care when they're actually about profit and maximizing work. Um, the third thought is that, um, and this is just a pet peeve of mine, but that final quote, um, and I'm gonna read it aloud again. For many years, the university has been imagined as a site removed, a place in which class, race, and social conflict can be managed. That era is over. The madness now has a glossy 30 page brochure and an ever increasing death count. Um, and, and this this is the little bit that's coming out of Shakespeare. Um, the use of, I chafe against the use of the word madness in that sentence. And it's very typical to describe the actions, just to describe the self-interested profit driven motivations of the hyper wealthy, the hyper elite, uh, those who are running the game as madness. But I think that's also a misnomer because the metaphor implies that they don't make sense, that they're irrational, whereas they very much do have their own rationality involved. It's just not one that cares about us. Um, and, and, and actual madness is a, is, is a completely, you know, entirely different uh, sort of thing. Um, so uh, anyway, th those are my three thoughts. I, I see chat is already hopping um, yes. and people probably have things that they wanna say, so I will shut up. Marsha asked a great question that I don't remember the, the answer to, you might remember, Nick. Um, how did, do they distinguish between public and private institutions? I don't remember them doing so. Mm -mm. They do talk about how um, public inst private institutions, especially those that are wealthy and public institutions that also have large endowments, um, are, they have a greater luxury of pretending that these necroliberal policies are not in place. Um, so in, in there, although who has actually, sp like what unit, what institution in 2020 or in 2021 has actually dipped into the endowment to provide greater care for their students? Like, I don't think any institutions are doing that. Um, uh, and it, it, it's a side comment in the piece, not something that they really get into, but I, I think that that is an element of um, further analysis. Endowments are only for emergencies. What on earth are we living through? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Excellent. I was just catching up with the chat. Um, mm -hmm. Something you, as you were talking, I remembered was this summer, when we're in the midst of thinking about how we were going back, um, a colleague said to me, you know, he had he had left the military after a good career in the military because he, he he really didn't want to be in charge of people's life and death situations anymore. And he really didn't expect that to be what he would be getting into in higher education. All right. So where should we take this conversation? Where do you want to go, folks? A question I had as we were talking was, do you think it is true that we have thought of the university as separate from the world? I'm not sure that's been my experience, um, but I wonder if that also get, getting back to Marsha's question of what does that go back to the kind of institution that you are at? I, so just speaking for myself, uh, I think that people of my generation and 
prior generations did see the institution as a, uh, a safe haven, a place where you, know, you could explore ideas. They had very romantic visions, which when I'm down in Concord is exactly how the legislature sees us, except they have us with huge endowments and you know, tons of money at our disposal. And it's always interesting dispelling those notions. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that it, it has been and amongst uh, people who aren't attending now probably still is seen as a place of, of safety and um, care and uh, the ability to do pretty much whatever you want, whether it's going down your lazy river or if you're climbing wall. And I wish people would quit writing about elite institutions as if they were college. Drives yes. me. I think that question about who owns the narrative of what higher education is, is really interesting. And I, I also think that we we bear some responsibility in this as well. I'm not sure that we've done a great job in higher ed over the last two to three decades recognizing that we needed to have a greater say in what that narrative was. I think it's only as the these stakes have become so clear that it, we've realized just how that story has shifted in ways that are really problematic for us. And we've lost, unfortunately, some of our cultural legitimacy to stand up and say, no, that's not what we are. That's not what we do. The thing that this also makes me wonder about though too, and something that I don't have much expertise about, I think about like other fraught moments in the history of the university and how this compares. And, it, and I guess the only one that I'm that like immediately comes to mind is like the late sixties, like during the civil rights movement when um, and the Vietnam protests when so much of that was playing out on campuses across the country and how the risk, the assessment of, of what it feels, the riskiness of being on campus now, how that compares to what that felt like. I just, I would be curious to hear from people who lived through that kind of cultural moment, like how this feels compared to that. Um, I realize they're totally different, you know, kinds of, um, tensions and, and scenarios, but it's interesting to see how institutions respond to crisis. Um, and certainly there, I, you know, we all know of some notable examples in the late sixties of universities doing a terrible job responding to crisis. But overall, I wonder how, how those two things compare. I don't know, just some thoughts. That was also a time when the crisis was useful for certain ideologies because you know, that was the time Ronald Reagan as governor of California stepped in and, and really attacked uh, the University of California and it began the process that, that led to a defunding um, so that at this point now the University of California is vastly more expensive than it was um, even proportionally for, for people then. Um, because right. that was that was the idea of the elite, you know, this this well, right. and you want, elite school is turning all you your children into like, <laughs> How much of what we're now sowing was reaped? Right. I get those backwards. Was so, what are we reaping now? <laughs> was sown then, right? Um, that that was was that the beginning of a shift in public perception um, of what was happening on campuses, you know, were people able to, able to look in on that and say, you know, this isn't, this isn't what college is supposed to be about. Uh, what's happening in these schools, and we need to, to get get better control of them or or shift that. In useful ways. One of the things I really like about this piece, uh, about this uh, essay, as a piece of analysis, um, is that it takes a systemic look at. Uh, the pandemic at racial violence, not just in terms of themselves as like the pandemic as a system, but looking at the systems, in this case, higher education, that have had additional pressure put on them because of the pandemic, because of um, George Floyd and subsequent protests, um, that we've got all sorts of overburdened systems that are built to barely function because that's where profits maximized. And as soon as anything happens, like Texas freezing over, everything breaks, um, literally, figuratively, on social media, et cetera. Um, 
one thing I'm thinking about with this particularly, and, and, and with our students right now, um, undergoing remote only classes, um, many of them isolating, um, getting meals delivered to them and such. Um, my sense, my extremely anecdotal sense is that, oh yeah, and how does that breaking then get, get politicized? Um, um, I, Martha might see where I'm going here. My sense is that the growing narrative among our students, and I think among um, budget-minded lawmakers, is that so much of education is a luxury good like dining, like dorms, like climbing walls. And we have become a system that is bloated with our own excesses, and that needs to be cut when actually those things are education trying to throw luxury goods onto the bill to hang on in the wake of budget cuts from state and federal government. Um, and personally, I would say those were bad moves, but those were moves made from a past crisis that was taken advantage of. But now, yeah, I fear that the, um, uh, the, the, the narrative is going to be, oh, the four-year college experience is a luxury good, rather than the four-year college experience has been systemically underfunded for decades, and now is at the point of, of breaking that it's at. And Marcia gets into the question of, of the public good. We have lost this sense. And I don't know how we got there, but I, the, I think one of the things that gives me hope or, or at least cause for action going forward is this idea of wanting to revitalize the concept of the public good, that it does really feel lost um, and, and unintelligible even to people. Um, and so advocating for that feels valuable. Right now, so that's sort of what I've I've been thinking about a lot over the COVID time too, because I think that um, we have seen, in amidst all of the the struggles and challenges and things, we've also seen these great moments of people able to come together and care for each other, and uh, within institutions and outside of them, and and wanting to to increase those sorts of moments and as a way to perhaps decrease some of the more negative ones. Um, it's been nice, for instance, to see, at least at Plymouth, our students' true responsibility with so much of this. We've asked a terrible amount of them. Um, and they've really just, it, it's such a pleasure to be in classes and talking with them because they're, they're doing, on the most, for the most part, really doing an extraordinary job in, in, in challenging situations. Um, and so thinking about, about that, um, generosity and the public good is sort of where I think I will end up moving after, after we survive all of this, you know, and get a, a bit of a rest, I hope, at some point. Do we feel like, do you feel like the only, when you talk about reconvincing someone who, I don't know, that there is a public good here is, are we talking about politicians? Like, like where does the, the power of that narrative lie? Like, who is it that we have to convince of that? Because I, I, I worry so much that ultimately the only solution is convincing people in political um, politicians that the, that this is the case and that's so that changes that's so mercurial right like that feels so not a cultural shift that feels like if we can just get the latest people who happen to have some power to see us differently and portray us differently maybe our funding will shift in some useful ways when ultimately if like the larger the larger foundation is cracked, right? About an understanding of what what we do and how what we do is public good. How do we how do we shift that? Like, how do we fix that foundation? I wonder. That's the biggest so, question. You're absolutely right because until until it comes from the voting base, until it comes from the people 
it doesn't matter who you have in Concord or in Washington or any other you know, capital making decisions because this disinvestment in state um, and public higher ed in, is nationwide. There are very few states, right. there are some, that are investing in it. I would love to know what's going on in Louisiana right now where they have this huge push to increase, yeah, to, in Louisiana, to increase money for K-12 and public higher ed. Um, so there are some states where you're beginning to see that change. And I'd love to go in and figure out why, what, what's causing that? Because I do think it has to start far below us. It really, in many great cases, it can't start with us because we're it. Uh, so instead, you know, you can't self-serve. Uh, you gotta figure out some way to get out there and make the change happen before they reach us. Yeah. I, I think it's a bigger problem than just us though, right? I mean, I, I constant, constantly am thinking about the United States Postal Service, right? I mean, the, the idea that the Postal Service needs to be profitable, like I just heard a story this morning about they're going to lose, and I don't remember what the number is, they're going to lose this amount of money. Well, of course, because, they, I mean, that's not what it's about. So I, I don't know, it feels like, it feels a little myopic to only be concerned about what's going on with higher education when really it's about public good, shared community and, and taking care of each other. That's what we've lost, I feel like. Mm -hmm. And I think that emphasis on care uh, and community is really important, is a really important part of this, uh, th th this frame that we're talking about um, because there's a rhetorical trap to try to get more funding, whether it be for higher education or through K through 12 or for the post office, which is, um, well, I can't directly spin the post office in, but I swear there's a connection. Um, the concept of the lost year, of how much time our students are losing due to the pandemic which is built against this ableist construct of a person at this point in their life should have this reading level, this arithmetic level, this public speaking level, et cetera, um, and be this competitive in the global marketplace, which the, the core, core belief there is your value as a human being is based on how much work you can produce, which, and, and that's at the core of the neoliberal model is that your value is your profitability. Um, so while we could perhaps get money, and, I, and I'm just, I know nothing about the situation in Louisiana, but I kind of wonder, ha having worked in Alabama for a while and knowing how bad, um, uh, uh, how bad nationwide rankings are for educational systems in Southern and Deep South states, one frequent refrain is, well, we've got to catch up with everybody else. And that might get you funding today but it ultimately feeds into the, the, the necroliberal machine moving forward. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's losing the war to, to, to win the fight. Um, I, so I think I mentioned earlier, I'm like raising my sister from thousands of miles away. She lives in Tennessee and so she's 18 um, and she's just a junior. So she's technically homeless right now and it's it's really interesting because I keep thinking about this idea of oh the university being a safe place and it's and I'm thinking a lot about how for me it is and is not all at once which is not really foreign to me for things to be both good and bad at all times um, and so I think about like in school there are there are, there are ways to use school to like fill the gaps in care. Like for me, very specifically, school was always a place where I got gaps of care filled by teachers, by support people. Like for example, like my sister's almost, I'm trying to get her connected with services. She can get a fee waived for the SAT. She can get, if she was in school, she'd get free lunch. She would um, get uh, help with, going to college and, and people helping her specifically because she's homeless and um, paying for uniforms if you have to have a uniform, all these things. And um, I had free lunch when I was younger and it's, it's really interesting to me 
to think about um, how that gets associated with legitimate care. I think it is legitimate, not only just in the financial sense, but I definitely, my, I did not like my house <laughs> and teachers were the only people that that filled that gap of care. And even into college, I think that's, I'm not gonna lie, I think it's still a thing. Like my sister is 18 right now and she's gonna go to college and honestly, 18, that you're still a child. She's still, she doesn't know, she like needs care. And I just keep thinking, like I have to like think about where she's gonna go to college. I'm like, I feel like I'd rather die than have her go to like a big R1 university and get lost in the sea of people. And, um, and then, but I'm also becoming really familiar with Tennessee's education system, which is so different from here. I'm like, what, where am I? Um, and I've been trying to get in contact with people. No one's getting in contact with me. So it's really interesting because these, there's these things in place to fill these gaps of care. Like for example, for homelessness, it's called the McKinney-Vento law. And one of the other things it does is if you're homeless, you can still stay in your school of origin, even if you don't have an address in that same place and they'll provide transportation for free for you. So these are really important things, but at the same time in the pandemic, like I'm finding it's very, very hard to get anyone to respond back to me because everyone is doing a million other things and the funding is not good. And like no one's answering me back, not her school counselor, not people from these departments that are supposed to be doing these things. I'm just like, what's going on? And it's just, so it's, it's like at once is a good way to fill those gaps. And then when there's a pandemic or something really intense, then it gets more intensely worse for those people. And it's interesting to me, but, it, but I do think it's interesting, the conflict internally for me of like, oh, the university is a safe place. Like school is a safe place to get those gaps of care filled. And also it's really not. And especially if we're talking about like professors, no one's filling gaps of care for professors, I would argue. For students, perhaps sometimes, but um, I don't, it's worse, they're workers. They're not gonna get any gaps of care filled, I don't know. But I do, I'm not gonna lie, I think that there is potential for the university to be the neoliberal ideas of the university to be undermined and replaced with some forms of mutual aid. Um, I don't know how quickly or how effective it's going to be, but I think there's potential for sneaking it in. I don't know. I think at the collab we do a pretty decent job, but yeah, yeah. something I thought about when I was reading the article again was, you know, we think about crisis as an opportunity for the the neoliberals, but I wonder if crisis is also an opportunity for others, um, for opportunity for. Um, more generous and caring approaches to things, you know, thinking back to the challenge of the 60s to the, the universities and what led us here. Is this another fault line? Uh, and are there ways to take advantage of it that aren't just about reducing everything to dust? And I think uh, a through line in, in Jess's comments here, and I, I'm looking at uh, Carl's comment in the chat too, uh, how do narratives of care obscure things like political accountability? Like, yes, absolutely. Um, like, I think that there's a, a distinction that we should draw here and in life, in our work, between care as, um, care as charity and as individual acts of caring and care as mutual aid, as webs of care, networks of care, systems of care, um, because the um, because care as an individual act, care as gap filling, is a tool of that necroliberal university and of, of like the necroliberal, you know, um, state of politics, state of America. Um, uh, GoFundMe is a safety net. Yeah. <laughs> Why should we have safety nets rather than just caring communities and societies? The safety net implies something went wrong to put you in that state when actually the system is designed to push people out as unproductive, as unhealthy, as aberrant, and force them into crisis situations. Um, so if we, so as much good things are being done, but like through GoFundMe campaigns, um, as long as they're thought of as gap filling rather than as constitutive of 
who we are as higher ed, as Americans, as people, as human be as human beings, it's it's going to keep it'll risk funding that uh, larger profit driven managerial system of our society. Also, on that note, um, I, I know like every time I talk to anybody about anything, I plug this book, but um, read Care Work, Dreaming Disability Just Justice by Leia Lakshmi Pepsna Semara Sinha. Um, it's a great model looking at uh, disability justice community and disability activists looking at mutual aid networks and care networks and 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 dreaming aspirationally how we could build these things up um, and not just fill the gaps but you know um, base communities on care um, the way, basically every time I use the word that's the book I'm thinking of so I, I, I strongly encourage it it's really good stuff Yes, and how do we do that now? Yeah. One of the things I, I kind of hope, perhaps naively, no, definitely naively, uh, to come from the pandemic is a, is a clearer idea of the need for networks of care. Um, because I hope that we have been able to see it or more people have been able to see just how precariously so many people have been surviving. The cynic in me sort of bats that down, but every now and then, one hour a day, I allow myself some optimism. Well, I, I kind of hope that would come out of the horrible, horrible situation in Texas, right? Yeah. I mean, to understand that having profit as the goal for fundamental services results in what happened in Texas. Like, but I, I'm constantly amazed at the ability of certain people to rationalize what happened there and, and to say, and to not recognize it as a systemic problem. Um, in much more practical terms, like what can we do as teachers today, this week? Um, one of my pet peeves, uh, I, I, a former colleague at Alabama was tweeting about this this week. So this is why this is on my brain, on my mind. But uh, he was talking about how broken up he feels whenever he has a student say, thank you so much for this flexibility on this assignment or the extension or, or, or what have you. I don't get this anywhere else. You're such a great teacher. Um, and his reaction and mine whenever I get that from a student is like, I just feel angry and terrible. It's like, I'm just doing my job. Um, so I think the kind of conversations that the CoLab has been hosting about flexibility and normalizing care as a practice, and this gets back to Jess's comments earlier, care as work. Mm. It's not an add-on. It's not something that is extra service in the margins. It's a core part of our jobs and should be recognized and honored and uh, paid as such, um, mm -hmm. rather than falling disproportionately on women, on people of color, on people with marginalized identities, as is, as is so often the case. Um, it's, it's the job, it is the work. Um, and uh, yeah, Carl, Carl says, I literally got one of those flexibility emails from a student during this, during, uh, student during this Zoom. Uh, during this Zoom, oh wow, yeah. And, and like, so I think like making that the narrative, pointing out that like, this isn't weird. This isn't um, safety nets. This is the experience of our students all the time in pandemic conditions and outside of pandemic conditions. And frankly, if other educators aren't being flexible, offering care, considering care a core part of their jobs, they're not doing their jobs to be blunt about it. And shifting that conversation, this isn't surplus labor, this is the work.
Yeah, part of that is a cultural shift at a place we're seeing, you know, through the collab, we've been trying to uh, encourage that kind of cultural shift here. Um, I think sometimes we feel like we're doing a great job at communicating with our small group of people who regularly come to Zooms like this. Um, um, we haven't quite figured out how to get out farther. You know, it's clearly making a great difference amongst a, a group of people, the CPLC folks and folks who come to our events, but there's also a large, a much larger university community out there. Um, and we see that some, especially working with advisees, you know, and the kinds of things you hear that they're going through, and especially at a time like this. I have a couple of students I've been helping who have, have been quarantined and it's just, can be very, very hard. Yep. And I think Martha's comment uh, is is really on point here. Uh, how do we reconcile this in a state where bills like this are being debated? And I believe this is a link to the copy pasted executive order against uh, um, uh, critical race theory that is now uh, up for, I don't know, I, I don't know what the, the current day status is, but it has been proposed in the New Hampshire House. Um, and yeah, and it's not just happening in New Hampshire. Like this is a, uh, as Carl points out, this is a, um, this is a broad wave. Uh, I'm going to read that article later that uh, Carl has linked uh, and and cry. Um, you know, getting this back makes me immediately think of the of the jump start. Yes, the jump start session that. Uh, uh, Becky Noel and uh, and Marcia and I were on where we were talking about like a humanities hub. Mm -hmm. um, I, this is not strictly a humanities issue, but the need for us to have some easy to use tool, vehicle, voice, where we can bring these conversations to a much wider audience, to the university as a whole, but also outside. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if that is... I, I like I don't I, I I know we need that tool. I don't know what that tool looks like yet. Um, but I but uh, I I think that that's something that we've come back to again and again this year. Although, and this is necroliberalism at work. Where we where do we have the time, the money, the energy to develop that? Because it's all been squeezed out at us, and we're having this conversation on the tail end of a Monday that we're already exhausted by this week. Um. Like, where do we find the charge to keep going? Anyway, uh, wonder, Kathy, you were going to jump in. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Kathy. Well, I, I was just going to say, you know, I, getting back to that idea of what can we do, um, I, I think the collab and the work that goes on there is amazing. And, and it is very much like preaching to the choir, right? But Matt just came from AU Council. I, you know, if those conversations were being had there, that's, that's the group of leaders, right? And, and having an expectation, you know, about what advising looks like in all of those conversations. I mean, I think we're starting to have some of those, but we're always having them with the same group of people. So I, I wonder if Matt, as our representative to AU Council, can suggest agenda items where there's conversation with those leaders about um, having conversations within their small their groups of faculty to, to talk about these kinds of issues. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was at AU Council as um, the uh, advising task force chair because we're talking about our new uh, registration schedule. Um, which was interesting in and of itself because that's a new registration schedule designed to be more uh, helping students with problems. You know, there's a problem week built into it. Um, so, uh, and that which to some faculty is going to seem like more work. Um, and that's the pushback we've been getting ever since we sort of debuted this in January is that you're now asking us to do more work, having to pay attention to our students' holds and that sort of thing. Um, so that's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, way forward. But yes, I think that broadening our conversations out, bringing them out and just continuing with them and, and bringing them up to at, um, hire, at hiring, 
um, is huge. I've, I am sort of addicted to being on uh, search committees. Uh, I've just finished my seventh um, in three years. Uh, and it's been really fun because you get to you get a sense of what people's philosophy of working with students is, even when you're hiring for staff positions, certainly. Um, and staff are just as important, if not more so, than faculty because they're sort of the, the frontline folks that students are dealing with in a lot of really challenging situations. Anyway. <laughs> so um, all of this is really making me think about something that's very near and dear to my like professional heart, which is open education. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is that, um, you know, there's lots of reasons why we should care about open education and open educational practices. But one of the reasons why for me, it has always seemed so important, particularly <coughs> in public institutions, is that when practiced well, it has the potential to expand the, the narrative of, of the purpose of our institutions beyond the walls of our institutions, right? And I don't know that we do a great job though of recognizing that potential and imagining what could happen. Most of my practice, for example, focuses on digital, but um, you know, we live in a community where we have tremendous impact on this local region um, as a university, we do. And I wonder if we need to be thinking more about how our teaching, you know, it, and also thinking about this in terms of how do we not make more work for ourselves, right? How do we not come up with an idea that nobody has the time or energy to see through. But what we do do is teach, right? And we work with students every day in so many different ways. What more could we be doing baked into our own pedagogical practices to expose to our community and our region the care of, of our institution and the way in which it is a critical piece of the care network of this region. Um, and it really brings to mind for me, like I spend way, way too much of my time reading comments on the WMUR Facebook account. Like, oh, Martha. please somebody come up with a chip I can put in my brain that will make me stop doing this. Um, but one of the things that's so striking when you read these comments is, um, and I'll say this, I'm guilty of this as well. When I read comments, I, I'm so guilty of going and clicking on people's profiles because I want to understand who the hell would say something like this. And one of the things that that's really striking, and of course you can't know a person by looking at their Facebook profile, but you can glean some things. And very often it's really clear to me that some of the people spouting some of this stuff are some of the most vulnerable members of our society, right? Like they are not advocating for policies or practices or approaches or care that would benefit themselves. They have absorbed a narrative about their culture and their society that actually does harm to them. But we are an institution that serves these people and works with these people in many ways. Some of these people are our students. And so I just wonder if there are more opportunities we could be exploring in the vein of open education to push out this story of what we do to show, make more visible to our network here um, what we do. Uh, frankly, I'm much more interested in seeing that kind of shift in understanding than I am in seeing legislators because legislators are going to do what they're, I mean, they're elected, right? Like, they're going to do what they do based on who elects them and who's paying, give, funding them. Um, Except in New Hampshire, you know, our legislators are your next door neighbor, right? It's just for Right. This is, you're right. You're absolutely right. And that's something that I lose sight of having moved here from Virginia, where there was not that kind of um, local nature to the politics in the and same way that they, there is here. Their pay is also ridiculous right a hundred dollars so i mean it's it's a there's also weird, there's also so many of them oh my gosh <laughs> there's, oh, there's yeah. like 124 yeah so i just feel like maybe that's this is a thing we need to be thinking about in the context of open education mm -hmm. i think this, i'm gonna try to like 
put together some ideas. Bear with me if it does not sound coherent at first, okay. But um, I just think a lot about, so this idea of people, students messaging teachers and being like, thank you so much for being flexible and like then basically just like being so relieved at flexibility. And I can tell you right now that I think it is one of the most generous things that someone can do is be flexible. And I just think about why that is and how it relates. Like, I didn't, we didn't get to see the whole slide of the definitions of neoliberalism, but this idea of a bureaucracy that is very rigid and not flexible, but it's really, there's so much, there's so many paradoxes at the core of this because it's at once extremely rigid and then also like expects everything to be resilient in response to its own cruelty. And so there's like, there are very intense paradoxes at the core of it, but this idea that like things are standardized to the point where it is dehumanizing and like, and I just am struck by um, how intense it is in the u in universities, but also now I'm like trying to help my sister like in the high schools too. It's like really, I just cannot explain to you how upsetting it is to me because like there's this idea that things should just keep going because we have a system and we have to keep the system going. And I was the whole, when the pandemic first started, I was like, why? Why can't we just like pause? I was like, and I was so interested in like how like if we have a snow day during a normal year, it's like, oh my God, the whole class is messed up. Like this idea that we are, things are like on a system and there's so many people in the system that it's very rigid and, um, and, and like, it was interesting because I was like, why can't we just like pause learning? And someone replied to me and they said, oh, we can't do that in like, in K through 12 because students will get, they'll turn 18 and then they'll want to leave and they won't finish. And I, I was like, okay, but you're literally stressing out more because they're like trying to survive and then you're like making them do homework that does not mean anything. And that's like a, a very intense thing that I don't know how to fix obviously, but this idea that flexibility is core to this. And it's interesting if we think about like, how can we take the university's care and show it to the community. And, and at once I'm like, yes, but also at the same time, no, because the idea like this rigidity is related to this idea of separating what we do in the university from like how we are as humans with bodies and needs. And so like, that's, it feels mm -hmm. like it's a huge core at the core of it because it's meant to feed the standardized system, especially like even more so now, although I wouldn't know because I didn't go to university like decades ago, but it's it's like this the bureaucracy and standardization is at the core and and for the university to help the outside people, I feel like it would have to shift that entire understanding of living in the world because like other people have networks of care like that are not in the university. And actually I would say that university is like worse than other people at creating those mutual aid and like communities of care because people who really cannot separate like a, a whole like compartmentalize their entire life like that we do it's not it doesn't work for people that are left for more vulnerable it just really doesn't and like it's it's an an external imposition on like how these things are tied together i don't know they it's just really I, I can't explain, like the idea that you have to turn in a homework assignment, no matter what, like, I just can't understand. I just really don't. And like, and, and it's and it's hard because if you're a professor, like, yeah, you like teaching and like, you can get caught up in that too. You're like, I have a plan and I'm gonna teach this course this way and it's gonna go this way. And there's like plans and like at once that is, normal to some extent but also they're people <laughs> we are people and like things can't be that rigid because it's not a machine i don't know and it's just really intense and the pandemic has really forced people to have to face that because it um you know today i was working with a student whose uh roommate 
tested positive with COVID and now he's um, lost his sense of taste and smell this weekend. So he thinks he's probably got it. And meanwhile, he's just failed a bunch of quizzes that were on an asynchronous class that he's taking because he was in the midst of dealing with COVID. And the, we're waiting to hear if the teacher will accept that. <laughs> like, it's like, you know, what do you do? Like, where, where are your priorities? So we've all had to face that within these systems that we build because the systems are comforting. You know? They make it able for us to get through things. And just to be simultaneously um, uh, optimistic, but also depressing. Um, these are, while the terms and while the iterations of uh, this fight are new, are 20th century specific, are 2021 specific. In some respect, this is a really old fight that's been going on for centuries, if not millennia in some respects. Treating people as profit, treating people as uh, cogs in the machine first. Um, free market economy, free market education. Like these are, these are pretty old ideas that have new iterations, but, um, and I think that's depressing because it puts us, it, it puts the size of the fight in perspective. But I think it's also optimistic because um, this isn't just, like, it's not something we can do overnight. It's not something we can do overnight. It's something we have to chip away at day by day, piece by piece. Um, yeah, who which gets makes access, it more manageable. It who makes gets more access doable. to flexibility? Who gets a lab flex? Because you know, if you were of a privileged class in the past, that was one of the privileges: is the ability to be to have flexibility, the ability to determine rules, to control things. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I think it's really interesting. I think a lot of privileged people are able to fit into the rigid system, and that is right. what perpetuates it. And like, and I, and again, to be optimistic and like depressing at the same time. Like, I will say that, and I was, and part of this this analysis is influenced by I was reading, uh, I read this whole book, like there was a lot of sociological takes on like self-harm recently. And there was this idea that like it gave an image of a traffic circle and people are self-managing in the traffic circle. And then like, why don't they just like stop self -man Why does everyone self-manage? And this idea that like this rigidity creates the, the injunction to self-manage and to, to fit into the system. And so anything that like deviates from that it gets people come up with ways to self-manage so self-harm being one of them and it was really and it's just really interesting to me because it happens i don't think that it's just at the societal level i think it happens in families and i think that it's very deep it's very deep and the, the idea that you have to self-manage to fit into the system at all times and people and it is a privilege to fit in that system and not have snags like disabilities and many other things and I just I'm very interested in it so sorry yeah that's yeah and to not notice that the system doesn't work for others as it works for you it's one of the great challenges of academia is we were all good at school it's why we're here <laughs> like it's really it can be a great challenge to work with um, people and empathize with people and understand people for whom school doesn't work because mm -hmm. for so many of us it was our refuge well, we are just about at the end of our time here. Does anybody want to offer any final thoughts or insights to lead us out? I'll just say the thing I said to Robin when she just asked us how it was going. I said, this is so good. It should be the first in a series. We should keep, keep talking about this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I feel like Especially on the that surface. question like how do we get this how do we get outside this zoom box right. with frequent collab participants and get to a wider conversation uh, especially that brings in um that's outside academia in new hampshire yeah i think that's a great goal you've just uh, established for us nick <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we will work on that Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, this has been Graveyards of Academe. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Carl. <laughs>